Hi, I'm Emily Elias. And I'm Tom Wiggins, and this is Desert Island Dips, the podcast where we pit condiment against condiment and ask, if you were trapped on a desert island, which five dips would you take with you? Now, there has not been much movement on the island. No, there isn't. We've got ketchup, brown sauce, English mustard, barbecue sauce, and sriracha sitting pretty comfortably in the shade. No real challenger. Imagine if nothing ever changed. Oh, things are changing. Okay, what? Is that a spoiler? I don't know. Maybe. (laughs) This episode today is about the mayonnaise with stuff in it, tartar sauce. So people that have listened to the mayonnaise episode might be slightly fearful for what's about to come. Because basically, yeah. we were so down on mayo. We were really anti-mayo. actually, thinking about it, I don't want to get into too much of it without you, because you're the one that knows about this. Our major criticism of mayo was that it was just a lubricant. So if you put stuff in it, mm. wow. Maybe maybe your fortune will be greater maybe for tartar sauce. Maybe everything flips on its head. Do you know what actually is in tartar sauce? Uh, it's Is it aioli rather than actual mayo? It's either a mayonnaise or aioli. Yeah, mayo or aioli base. And gherkins mm-hmm. and capers. Yep. I don't know anything else. Dill and lemon juice. Okay. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of got like greeny, chunky bits inside yeah. it. Um, so I feel like I should preface this whole episode with the fact that like I've legitimately done a lot of research and legitimately have gotten nowhere. Right, right. Quickly, before you carry on, uh, you're suggesting that we don't always do a lot of research. No, but like, that. you know... <laughs> No, but you know that thing where it's like you do a ton of research and then you have like all of this stuff to talk about. And it's like, I just kept driving into like dead end after dead end after dead mm. end. And I like took out a dozen books from the British Library. I've done a ton of research and I am no closer to understanding what is going on with tartar sauce. Okay, so should it go on the island and then we'll finish this off? No. <laughs> <laughs> I've li- On this path of learning and discovery, I have found... In some incredible things out and i do have a story to paint for you good good but it's just like it, you're gonna see as i put it together it seems a bit bitty and it doesn't well, really make a lot of sense but i, I think, have i have a plan i think that the listeners will enjoy filling in the gaps and like i did with one of the other episodes we can leave it as a sort of open-ended narrative for them to decide how it ends so these are yeah, work? yeah let's okay. do that Okay, so let's start with like the name, tartar sauce. Yeah. If you want to talk about the name, you got to go back 800 years to this dude named Genghis Khan. Have you heard of him? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Did he spell it with an E? I'm not sure how he spelled it. (laughs) But he was like making this giant Mongolian empire and he had these allies. Okay. The Tartars. Oh, right. Wow. So the act like the people, the ethnic group Tartars. Yeah, yeah is the origin of where the name for this comes from. Well, do we know how they spelled their name? Without any. Okay, there we go. So as like the Tartars are going across Europe and conquering things, Mm -hmm. naturally, some of their cooking techniques would get passed on to the Europeans. That seems like a fairly logical Mm -hmm. concept. So there's one story that uh, kind of like reflects the Tartars' influence on people. And it was like this, this common myth. Mm. that the tartar horsemen would put a slice of horse meat beneath their saddle in the morning and they would tenderize it and (laughs) pound it as they rode Mm. and then would eat the raw meat for dinner. But that was a myth, you said. That was a myth. It is was debunked by the Cambridge medieval history in 1924. But they wouldn't eat it at the end. Exactly. (laughs) What was the point of it? Because they believed that the horse meat had like curing medicinal properties that would help the cure the horse's sores. That's weird. Underneath the saddles. I mean, they're sitting on a horse and then they put a bit of dead horse in between their ass and the horse. I mean, just sit on the horse. I don't know. I don't um, you know, like a mattress topper. Exactly. A mattress topper of horse For horses. Meat. <laughs> The old mattress topper of horse meat. (laughs) So this is like one sort of story around the Tartars. Okay. And the Roman Catholic Church, they said that the consumption of horse meat in Europe, they're Mm. like, 
let's shut it down. This is illegal. You can't do it. So I don't think it is, but yeah, carry on. During the medieval times, yeah, they were but... like, we we own this shop. Yeah, shut it down. Okay. So the sport, Tartars sport. like me, like tread like food. Uh, trend mm-hmm. of eating raw horse meat then translated into eating raw beef okay so that's kind of like how that sort of like what's that called steak Carpaccio? tartar oh right okay yeah which is what you might be familiar with yeah in a restaurant and now when you get it in a restaurant it usually has like a raw egg yolk on top of it mm-hmm. and in your meat and it's like yum yum delicious mm-hmm. well there used to be a dish called, uh, okay, this is from 1921, Augustus Escoffier, who's like this legendary French chef who mm-hmm. like wrote tons of books about French cooking. Um, in 1921, he listed beefsteak a la tartare mm-hmm. in his culinary guide and a beefsteak a l'américaine. And the a l'américaine had no raw egg yolk on it, but had tartar sauce on the side. Okay. The, that's the American one. That's the American one. And then by 1938, in his culinary Bible, it had morphed and a la tartare just meant with the raw egg yolk on top. Like the two dishes kind of combined and okay. then tartar sauce was like thrown at the wayside. Okay. So the tartar sauce had been discarded from this dish. Yes. It was like... But because it was associated with the sort of pair of them... It was originally it, called like tartar sauce. The name had, the name stuck with it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But like when you're looking and like, that's great. Like mm-hmm. I was pretty satisfied with that piece of information. Mm-hmm. However, when you look at the dates of it, it's like we're talking in this sort of area with this French chef, like the 1920s, 1930s. Tartar sauce had been around a lot longer than that. There's a, there feels like there's a jump. There's a giant yeah. jump in it. So I'll, and, and like within that jump is like when did we start eating it with fish yeah because like right now all i'm finding it with is like meat like mm-hmm. horse horse or beef horse, horse meat <laughs> uh i mean then, you can see how the horse became beef right yeah that's fairly easy that one makes sense but when when did this uh when did this shift happen shift from beef to, to your fish finger sandwiches in the pub happen so yeah. like naturally i'm perplexed Mm -hmm. and so i called my sister the historian okay wait why have you never done this before for the podcast because i've been able to she's not a condiment historian she's not a number one she's not a condiment historian she's a british historian Mm -hmm. so slightly different and i've been able to handle this on my own i felt quite proud of myself but it's like things are getting real yeah i need my big sister to help me (laughs) And, like, I need to be, like, really pathetic about it and, like, grovel and, like, send her, like, whiny WhatsApp messages of, like, I don't get it. <laughs> because that's how I'm wired. Um, are you going to even name check her or are you just going to just leave her Hannah anonymous Elias. for thing? <laughs> No. Her name is Hannah Elias. We share the same last name. Yeah. Share some genetics. Mm-hmm. She's great. Mm-hmm. If you have any historical needs that need attending to, <laughs> call my sister. Let her know. Okay. So, anyway, she's, like... On her lunch break, she sends me this email and it literally says, like, tartar sauce research on my lunch break. (laughs) (laughs) And she's, like, pulled out some things for me to look at. So so it did go somewhere. It did go somewhere. Okay, good. So this is why I went to the British Library, because she had these resources that I had to, like, Mm. painstakingly get out from the vaults of books and, like, go through. And in those books, these are the certain things, these little, like, tidbits I found out. Mm -hmm. So mayonnaise, it becomes, like, a popular sauce in 1806. Yeah, I was trying to remember what the mayonnaise history was like. So we've got mayonnaise. We've also got like industrialization where like, you know, mm-hmm. there's more products coming up, more factories, more workers. We're like industrial revolution. Let's make some sauces. Let's make some condiments. And then in 1860, the first fish and chip shop opened. Oh, now we're talking. So this is based in the strong Jewish tradition. Mm hmm. Of battering fish and deep frying it. Yeah. And while like fish and chips lived separately, they kind of got married. Separate lives. Separate lives. They got married in 1860. Okay. Uh, the first fish and chip shop was opened by a guy named Joseph Malin. Mm-hmm. He was a Jewish immigrant and he opened it at 70 or he opened it in Bow at 78 Cleveland Way. I think I've heard this before because you think fish and chips, well, that must have been at the seaside. Bow is not by the sea. No. 
um, which is surprising. There, like, I mean, it's not surprising that it's not by the sea. I mean, that that was the site of the first one. And the like popularity of this like combination like steadily grew, mm. and slowly there were more and more fish and chip shops opening up. Like up until like we head into the Second World War, this is becoming like a very popular food trend. Mm-hmm. And then like war happens and things get shut down a bit. So yeah. Um, now, the first appearance of tartar sauce mm-hmm. in a national newspaper mm-hmm. in the UK. It was in 1878 in the Times. Okay. It was published as a ministerial fish dinner. So on the news... Uh, an article or an advert or... It was an article, an article about... about fish dinner. Yes. It was okay. an article about like a ministerial fish dinner. Yeah. And it listed like all of the fancy pants people who were there. And then it listed what was on the menu. Mm-hmm. This is how... This is the first mention of it. It says... They ate ye trout from ye river spy, grilled with ye sauce of tartar. So we've got trout and tartar sauce. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying... That's not a common fish and chip shop fish, is it? No, but I'm I'm not saying this is like the exact origin of it, Mm -hmm. but perhaps because now... It has been published in a national newspaper, and this is a source where women and cooks are going to looking at recipes and w- seeing what the upper classes are eating, mm-hmm. that they're seeing that like, oh, this tartar sauce is being served with fish. At a ministerial dinner. At a ministerial dinner, no less. We want to be like those guys. We aspire to be like them. Yeah, yeah. We've got this lovely fish and chips, which is very like easy for us to access and it's become like a very like is becoming a more popular fast food like let's marry that together together. so that is like i think that is like my best guess of how this all sort of happened theories are absolutely fine around here but i mean i think it's plausible yeah absolutely like but and the trout did you say yes i mean when we're trying, because we're trying to find that gap from steak or horse to fish, trout is a little bit more like a meat meatier than. It's a meaty than, fish. It's meatier than a, than a you know your like your a cod white bait. or your haddock or whatever that you're having, right? Yeah. Is that, was that fair? Like it's a solid fish. It's a big old fella. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I don't know. I, mean, I don't I, like trout, so I can't raise my shoulders high enough. But I think, yeah. Uh. Here's the gist. So, like, McDonald's is obviously, like, a big sort of, like, marker of when things, like, really infiltrate the main Yeah, yeah. Main yeah. Street. And you do like talking about McDonald's as well, don't and you? And I do. Yeah. Uh, so, McDonald's first put the filet of fish on their menu mm-hmm. with tartar sauce mm-hmm. in 1962. Okay. So, a bit later on yeah. in the game. You can... Th- these things take, take time, don't they? So, what was that? The other geezer was the 20s, was it? Yeah. So, yeah, I, 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 that's, that that fits for me. Now, is would the you McDonald's be so- tartar sauce? Because I've never, I don't think I've ever eaten a fillet hot fish. Because I mean, why would you? Um, what's the what's their tartar like? It's pretty much this. It's pretty much what you'd expect. It, it's, is it is it quite? Th- it's not chunky. It's quite smooth. It's, or I would say it's like on the smoother side of a tartar sauce, yeah, yeah. but it's like definitely be. On the smoother side, because it's processed and it's being shot through yeah. a like condiment gun. Because if you get a sachet of tartar, then I mean, there's no big chunks of gherkin and stuff in that, is there? No, it's pretty mulched down yeah, by yeah. that point. Yeah. Um, which for me is not the way I would want to uh, enjoy my tartar sauce. No, I'd want gherkin chunks. Yeah, I think a lot of people would want mm. gherkin chunks. Um, so like tartar sauce, I guess you know, I'm gonna say 800 years of history. Why not? Uh, at least a solid 200 like at least a solid 200 at least, at least. i can't remember genghis khan's birthday so uh but would you be surprised to hear that 2018 mm-hmm. marked the first ever national tartar sauce day i am surprised by that because there is a national day for absolutely bloody everything right so what has tartar who, whoever the ambassador for tartar sauce is what were they doing or minister, let's say minister, the minister for tartar sauce. What has he been doing all this time where he hasn't gone, isn't it about time we had our own day? So do you want to hear about the guy who got 
national tartar sauce the day that he he's the one that's responsible for that recognition kind of but okay. we'll go with it yeah uh david Firsch. so he was mm-hmm. born 1902 yeah. He was nine of ten children. Mm-hmm. His dad, Samuel, had a cafe in Cincinnati, Ohio. At the age of 13, he's like, screw school. I'm dropping out. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get Tata sauce the recognition it deserves. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open, I'm going to work with my dad and then I'm going to open my own cafe, uh, which he does. Mm-hmm. And by the 1930s, he's got, or 1939, he's got his own Mainlander restaurant um, that is Cincinnati's first year-round drive-in. Oh, year-round. Year-round drive-in. I didn't realize that they were seasonal. It's you like, learn something new every day, don't you? Well, if there's like tons of snow, you're not going to want to sit in your car and eat a burger, are you? Well, oh, hang on. Drive-in? Yeah. Or drive-through? Drive-in. Drive-in restaurant? Yeah. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Yeah, so it was a really popular trend of the time to like have like... You would drive into the car park. Well, and they'd serve you. A woman would come out. Oh, now you say that. Yeah, With yeah. like either in I've roller skates it. or on feet. And yeah. she would say, take your order. She'd go back. They'd make your food. She'd bring your order to you. I think I've seen that in the movies. You've seen, totally seen the movies. Yeah, yeah. So they were like the first drive-in restaurant. Okay. So in 1946, he goes to this like food convention and he meets this guy named Bob Wine. Um, and he is introduced to the concept of a double-decker hamburger. It kind of looks like a Big Mac. and As in a burger with two burgers in it. Like, yeah. Yeah. And he... I mean, the first time you find out that that is a possibility, it would blow your mind. Totally. Yeah. He's like, three pieces of bread? What? The- this is crazy. <laughs> and he gets permission to make sort of this big boy burger. Okay. Is that you calling it big boy burger? No, it's called the big boy burger. <laughs> and in California, they topped it with Thousand Island dressing, mm-hmm. but... Uh, first didn't like that. Dave wasn't a fan of it. No. So he's like, I'm going to put tartar sauce on it instead of Thousand Island dressing. That is a left field move. But yeah. Okay, Dave. So you got like two beef patties and mm-hmm. tartar sauce in between. Mm-hmm. I don't know how I personally feel about that, but people in Cincinnati love it. And he has like, the restaurant has expanded and it, like they've got multiple locations. Um, and that's their thing. That's become their thing, the double burger with tartar sauce. Yeah. I mean, you can see where he's coming from, because if you have a burger and you've not got gherkins in it, then what what are you messing, like, what are you doing? So you might as well put a sauce in there that's got, some people have mayonnaise in a burger, but they're probably a bit weird, aren't they? So, you know, yeah, okay. So by by the 1950s, and this is kind of disputed amongst, like, the Cincinnati burger elite, um, whether he was the <laughs> first guys. one to put tartar sauce in the burger or another restaurant called Tucker's was. Right. Um, by the 1950s, it was like a very, I guess, niche regional thing that the burgers, your beef burger would have tartar sauce in it. Mm. Um, and in 2015, the company was bought by NRD Capital. Uh, so you see where this mm. is going? NRD Capital is like, <laughs> hey... We don't want to alienate our loyal diners, but we also want to increase the power of our brand. So they petitioned to get... National Tata Sauce Day. And they won. And the restaurant gave out 500 jars of the original sauce. Oh, that's good of them. And the Cincinnati no- mayor mm-hmm. uh, wrote up, like, the Cincinnati mayor made a declaration, which is very kind. And it got a really favorable write-up in the Catholic Telegraph because... <laughs> That's all everyone wants, really. <laughs> the, the day was made to correspond with the first Friday in Lent. So it was March 3rd. Uh, what's the first... Is that the one... Is that the day where you, that you stop eating stuff? Like, I think, well, it's the first Friday in the okay. Lent season. Right, okay, fine. Um, do you know what has struck me is that there's quite a lot of condiments where there's sort of two people that are kind of um, vying for recognition as to who did it first. And they're always local to each other. Or yeah. often they're local to each other. It seems, always like there's, it seems like there's like a rivalry to it. That's, well, yeah. I mean, and to me, that just seems inevitable that if you run a business, uh, you know, a hospitality business, like a restaurant or whatever, and you come up with this thing that you go, hey, I'm put, now I'm putting this in. You'd, you'd tell people that. You'd advertise it. You'd like, come here and try my whatever. And if it seemed to be doing well, then any of your rivals are probably going to do the same thing. And then... Is that uh, like, like, who got there first? Well, the history, yeah. like, who... the 
What I mean is then a hundred, however, hundred and whatever years, however many years later, when inevitably someone starts a podcast about condiments and wants to talk about it, it's very difficult to work out who it was. And yeah, you make a good point. History is written by the victors. Is that what they say? Um, So you never know really if the person who is credited at the end with doing the inventing it was necessarily the one that did it first they're just the one that did it to the most successful degree degree which is not unique to condiment uh invention so by episode 14 of desert island dips you realize it's all it's all a sham we don't know if any of this is true (laughs) (laughs) no i just think it's an inevitable um uh, consequence of history consequence of, of, of human existence um I know we kind of touched on this like throughout the podcast, this sort of like um, this, I guess, bugboo. Is it bugboo? Is that bugbear? Their... Bugbear. This bugbear about paying for condiments. Yeah. Um, and I want to bring it up again with Tartar. Well, sauce. it is one of the condiments. It is. Um, so, television chef Rick Stein. Okay. Well, he who... never has to pay for any condiment, surely. I- I'm sure he doesn't. Uh, Canadians <laughs> who don't know who he is, he's a man who is on television every Saturday morning, basically telling us about wonderful foods from around the world he He has a very successful restaurant in cornwall isn't it yeah in in cornwall in padstow he's quite well known for fish isn't he very well known for fish and he kind of based like i guess like he his stein's fish and chip shop in north cornwall is on the high end of fish and chips i've never been there but i that is the impression i get of it because i mean most fish and chip shops are fairly low rent right yeah and that's not I'm not slagging them off because you don't really want them to be any more than that. Whereas this is sort of come here for our our ups. Yeah, they've they've gentrified fish and chips, essentially, which I don't necessarily think people actually want. But it has that that sort of niche has been carved out. So he is charging one pound twenty five for tartar sauce. What? Yeah. One twenty five. One twenty five. That's insane. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I'm used to some. Every now and then, you go, "Oh, it's five p for a sachet of sauce." But I mean, if I'm paying one twenty five, I would expect it to come in. I don't know, some sort of gold plated urn uh, of tartar sauce. Urn. <laughs> yeah, Rick Stein's gonna be have to be spooning that out for me, and not just going away with it when I'm. 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 You're leaving that there, Rick because I'm not necessarily finished. And when I want some more, you're going to come back and you're going to give me some more. So the Telegraph uh, wrote an article about it and you could tell the people who worked on it were super proud of their piece because the byline (laughs) is Telegraph reporters. I love when publications do that because it's just like nobody wants to take credit for it. I don't want to be associated with this. (laughs) Um, And it cites TripAdvisor reviews as their main quotes. Like, I can understand why you wouldn't want your name with that. And... Uh, one disgruntled customer quipped, Captain Birdseye would be ashamed, <laughs> never mind Rick Stein. <laughs> well, hang on. Rick Stein's the one doing it. So he clearly isn't ashamed. But I completely agree. Captain Birdseye would be ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> um Right of, right of reply, the <laughs> Rick yep, Stein yep, conglomerate that. say that, you know, they make their tartar sauce on site, the mm-hmm. team of chefs, mm-hmm. and it's labor intensive. Uh, this isn't like you're getting like a pack of like, you know, It's not commercial- just a sachet of it's not McDonald's a sachet. stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's it's their sort yeah, of like crafted tartar sauce. Still. Um, and, you know, if you were to eat it within the restaurant, it's only a pound. If you're going to take away, it's one for 25. I still find I've that outrageous. I've never understood that whole if you're going if you're eating in it costs different a different amount to if you're taking it away it's an anomaly for this country which i don't understand yeah like so if you go into like any like fast food restaurant or and you say i'm eating in they'll charge you more they'll charge you the vat is it or they'll charge you more than if you were to like take it out so i always say i'm eating out and then i just sneak back in and sit down because nobody's going to tell me i can't sit down and eat it because i'm cheap i can't remember i because it it doesn't seem to happen so much anymore, but I yeah I don't underst- I've never under- quite understood that that business. Now it should be cheap. It should definitely be cheaper to go away, right? Yeah, I think it should. I actually think Although to be honest, I think it would be packaging. like yeah, I think it should be more expensive if you take it away because then you're using like damaging environmental packaging yeah. for it. Whereas if you were eating it, in, it's just going to be a plate that you can wash plate, up. You wash up, yeah. 
And if you agree to wash up yourself at the end, it should be... Uh, discount. Th- there should be uh, another Deep price discounts. for that. Yeah. Um, but this... Anyway, that is outrageous. That's £1.25 outrageous. for tartar sauce. When... What my problem with this is that um, it is such an uh, sort of accepted and or, no, in fact, expected part of a higher end fish and chips, which is exactly what he's doing, that to suggest that you should pay more for it is not not acceptable for me. I agree with you. Or there should be like a free option of tartar sauce and you could like upsell. A, like a slightly rubbish one. That yeah, because I would probably be like, <laughs> John I the can't good taste one. the difference. It's a bit more. Yeah. <laughs> um, one person who definitely couldn't taste the difference is a woman named Misty, who is reportedly addicted to tartar sauce and decided to be a part of a TLC reality show called Freaky Eaters. <laughs> oh, they, we used to have that here. By the way, can I just say excellent segue? Thank you. Um, yeah, Freaky Eaters was on here. Did you ever watch it? On like Channel 4 or something. I don't know if I ever did. It was always people that would be like, I only eat like eggs and that's it. Just an an egg a day for every meal. It was always weird stuff like that. I, I mean, which is weird and it's, yeah, that is freaky. Um, but I don't remember if there was ever anyone that was addicted to a particular condiment. Well, season two of the show and I, like you can watch the entire episode on youtube and i'll okay. put a link on social media Excellent. um but it's about this woman named misty she's a single mom and a truck driver who discovered the joys of tartar sauce when it was accidentally put in her doggy bag and since then she w- would eat 10 bottles a week blimey uh a stunning fourteen thousand calories a week now the journey of misty is incredible because <laughs> she uh She'll eat it on, like, just, like, squirt it straight into her mouth. She'll... <laughs> she puts it on red velvet cake. I think unless you squirt something that you're addicted to directly into your mouth, you're not addicted to it. <laughs> that's the that's the the equivalent of the condemnments for addict- addiction. But oh. she is, in in effect, she I is... I think this is... Com- she's, eat, she's eating it on her own. She would eat that with a spoon out of a, a, a jar or whatever. She's got too far. So she is essentially... She is... She is fundamentally de- uh, messing with the definition of a condiment yeah. by doing that. Well, I mean, I think you're messing. So this with- is a bigger. This is a bigger deal. Sorry, I didn't mean to be. But th- she is possibly having bigger implications. What this could mean is that we can't even consider putting this on the island. I mean, can I? Oh, oh my gosh! <laughs> Don't even get me started. Can I? Okay. Can I get through like this, all the things that she would have been with? A, because this is insane. All of this stuff would have been a waste. <laughs> The Sham Podcast this, wasted your time. No, all of those trips to the British Library, emailing your sister, all a waste because Misty eats tartar sauce straight what out of the have bottle. I done? <laughs> yeah, carry on. Sorry, what, what else did she do that's weird? Oh, man. Okay, well, as so I straight regret, out of the bottle into the mouth. Okay, and as I regret my life choices, I'm sure Misty regrets her life choices of eating all of these foods on television. She puts it on Jello. Oh. She makes tartar sauce sandwiches, which I think is that gross. That's not too bad. Cheetos, spaghetti, breakfast waffles, Trix cereal. She will take two is. cupcakes, like yep. Hostess cupcakes. I don't know if you like. What's sort of a Hostess cho- like, cupcake? They're like a chocolate sort of uh, cupcake. Okay. And she'll put tartar sauce in the middle and make no. it into a Hostess t- cupcake tartar sauce sandwich and then eat it. Although, to be fair to her, I f- sort of feel a bit like this about how you feel about... No, not how you do. Your insistence that maple syrup can be eaten with savory foods i mean it's no different i want to put it on spaghetti i'm not no crazy different. you know you're not a uh, buddy in elf eh? no <laughs> so like maybe that's where she got the idea from <laughs> oh my god so like of course there are psychologists on the show that are there to cure her because yeah. this is a completely not made up addiction um, and this is a completely legit show and these psychologists don't look like they've just like, they look legit. They don't look mm. like they've just gotten their diplomas from a yeah. diploma mill. My, I mean, my problem um, with that is that she's they, not necessarily got a psychological problem. No, she, just just like, she just sauce. likes tartar sauce. She just likes tartar sauce. Yeah, leave her alone. But as they're quote unquote fixing her addiction, yeah. the one of the cures is pouring a 40 gallon, a 40 gallon canister. So like a drum, a giant drum of tartar sauce <laughs> down a children's slide and into a kiddie pool and making Misty walk barefoot through it. 
That's that, what down the slide. That's just dangerous. Not down the slide, but like they oh, just they, into just the to, pool. Yeah, they pour it down the slide and into the to... pool, and then they make her walk through the pool. I don't know why they have to pour it down the slide. So that she can confront how much tartar sauce she's eating yeah. in a year. Oh yeah, because filling a child's pool with it wouldn't. But you'd be like, well, it doesn't seem that much. <laughs> pour it down a slide, then we'll see how much there is. I mean, I just <laughs> I question the credentials of these people. So whatever at the end of the show obviously there's like this like touching moment mm. where misty has gotten is she him... cured yeah she's cured spoiler, spoiler. she's lost seven pounds well that's good that's good and she hasn't had tartar sauce since the psychologists went away okay well i mean i, mean, I, I suppose if it, if if it was like any other addiction you do have to cut it out completely it's probably difficult to... Addiction ex- expert Tom Wiggins here. I mean... No, that's mate, true though, isn't it? I don't know. I feel like this is just like... This is reality TV run amok with a condiment. Yeah, that is quite surprising. And it's like, there's no... I just... I just don't feel like any of this is real. Maybe... <laughs> <laughs> I can't like, believe I feel you're like doubting done... it. How more real could that have been? Honestly. M- Misty is drowning herself in tartar sauce. <laughs> I mean, if that was literally true, then yes, there would have been a problem. Then we need an intervention. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think they would—they were going for hyperbole there, weren't they? I just a bit of hyperbole. It's the classic American reality TV. <laughs> uh, I would like to. In fact, this maybe is where we go in the future. Uh, we could do a version where we find people that are addicted to all different types of condiments. It'd be fun, wouldn't it? Let's put. Let's. Uh, maybe I should have sent an email to Misty to see how she's really doing. Yeah, come on, Misty, tell the truth. Tell the truth. Are you carrying it around in your bag? You never know, do you? I bet you she is. Bet she's back on the sauce. Oi. Oi. That's very good. Is that the closest thing we've had to an actual joke I in the entire thing? It took us fourteen episodes to get here. <laughs> and I think it was worth it. But as yeah, going back to the on or not, and we. We don't need. I don't think a regular listener will be surprised that that uh, tartar sauce isn't going to go on the island. But it, it, yeah, if it had been, uh, if we'd been early on still, then I think maybe it would have had a chance of taking over from mayo and making more mayonnaise, mayonnaise more exciting. In, in, I mean, just aioli I think is better than normal mayonnaise. So you're already one step up, and then if you add gherkins in as well on top of that, you're another step up. Then you have to come back down again one because you you put your capers in there. Um, so if it was a, a straight tartar mayo fight, I'd probably go tartar, but because we are at the point where we are limited with space and we have that set five that we've been there for a few weeks now. I'm, I'm pretty ruthless about it. And like, maybe we need to next time, like, uh, go pick a condiment off the list that we think can be an actual challenge and contender. A big uh, favorite. Yeah, yeah. Because like with this, I'm just kind of like, it is not something... I reach too often or that I use on multiple food products the, that like it, for me it just that's what kind of like makes it fall off the list yeah it's like it comes back to your I think it was Liam Perrins he said there weren't enough uses for it what's the sauce um and we've had a few others where there's been sort of yeah but I only really use it for one thing so and it's not like I would die if I or like or I need it in my life do you know what I will have to bring up and I'm not misty I do, uh, and as I do every time, I normally I would say I think I can probably synthesize this from other things I've got on the island. On this occasion, no, I don't think I can. And you won't miss it either. And no, and that says it all, doesn't it? That exactly does. I'm not fussed by the fact that I don't have a little cap- a tartar sauce experiment to keep me occupied on the island. So I'm afraid, no, no space for you. Despite what you would have to assume would be an abundance of fish. Agreed. Um, well, on that note, do you want to be the social media police and tell people how to get in touch with us so they can watch this awesome video of Misty yeah. walking through a kiddie pool of I can't, tartar sauce? I, I can't see how anyone who listens to this that doesn't follow us already will not now follow us in order just to see this video. Uh, Twitter, we are Desert Island Dip. Single dip. Uh, Facebook, we are Desert Island Dips. All the dips. Where you will get information about uh, new episodes coming out, uh, condiment news in general, um, all the stuff like that. Just, just to, I mean, general top bands, really, when I can be bothered to log into the account. Uh, we are on email. Oh, yeah. We are proper up to date. And guys, 
I'm dreaming big of when we're going to get our first we're gonna listener get an email. email. Well, we're, so far, we're going to get that one from Beyonce. Beyonce. We're going to get that one from Beyonce from her email address of the day, aren't we? Or the lawyers of Tabasco. Or the lawyers of Tabasco. Uh, Does Island Dips at Gmail dot com though, right? If anyone wants to send us anything, if there's a, a condiment that you'd like us to cover, I mean, you'll probably do it on Twitter. But if you wanted to go into more detail than 180 characters, 180, 280. Oh, who cares anymore? It's gone. The world's gone mad. It's gone too far. Uh, then do get in touch let us know uh, but I hope you've enjoyed the show leave us reviews and stuff on the internet because oh, yeah, those do that well actually do help people find and it's us. helpful for others or like just poke your friend and like tell them to listen yeah steal their phone download it for them if, and tell them they'll enjoy it later if you've got a friend like Misty who's addicted to a condiment that we would like to hear from we her either. as well <laughs> yeah yeah that if we have done or we are almost certainly going to do then tell them but I don't have the budget to buy you a paddling pool that I can fill <laughs> 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 they don't really have sort of uh local I paddling have, pools anymore do they i don't have like tlc money where i can get a paddling pool tlc as in the band no tlc like the network that oh, made the show <laughs> but also I thought, the band I thought I, you meant lisa left eye lopez and the other two <laughs> i like how you only remember the member of the band who has died that's the dead one right yeah yeah oh that's a sad one R.I.P. Left Eye. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we will be back in a couple of weeks' time with another episode of... Desert Island Dips! Bye! It's becoming the official anthem. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>